Today, the, the title of my sermon is something which you might have heard as children. You will have heard this phrase as children, but when you heard it as a child, you were probably filled with great fear. It was probably said to you, the title of my sermon was probably said to you by an angry parent after you had done something wrong. I know, looking out at you lovely bunch, you've never done anything wrong, have you? But I'm sure this was said to you on those rare occasions when you did something seriously wrong. And my hope is you're not filled with the same dread or fear that you were filled with as uh, children. But this morning, I am going to tell you that my intention today is that I'm going to lay down the law. That is my intention today. Now, your parents might have said, I'm going to lay down the law in this house. And what they often mean by that is, you've broken it, and I'm going to remind you that uh, what you have done is wrong. So I'm going to lay down the law this morning, and so you better listen. Uh, Because this section of James talks about the law of God. It talks about what is expected of us, what is asked of us. And in this section, we are reminded that the standard that God requires of each and every one of us has not been met by any of us. The standard by which God calls The holy, perfect, pure God calls us to be perfect, holy. In everything we do to live like Jesus did. And the reality is how far we have fallen from that. And so we are reminded by the expectation of the law that has not been met by any of us. But in Jesus. Through him, there is the law, but there is also the solution to our problem. That we have broken God's law and God has provided an answer. God has provided what we needed. He has provided a saviour. One who can forgive. One who can set us free. One who can bring freedom into our lives. And so today we're going to be grappling with this concept of the law. I wonder if you've ever wondered, what is a Christian's relationship to the law? Should we still have to follow the law? What is the law? And we'll cover these types of things as we uh, look through James. And the way I want us to, the way I've structured my sermon, the way I want us to think about it, is each of my points are a almost a a legal word or a legal terminology. So as they're thinking about the law, there are a few legal phrases that James uses. And so uh, as we look through this passage, we're going to see in James 2, what is this law? And what does it mean for me? Thousands of years after this book was written, what does it mean for me? Well, my first point is taken from verse 9. And verse 9 says, But if you show partiality or favouritism, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. My first legal term is convicted. We are convicted. My first point is a very cheery one, I must admit. Some of you might know what it is like to be convicted of something. Maybe some of you have been before a judge and you've been uh, convicted of that particular crime. Maybe some of you haven't been convicted of a crime because you got away with it. Or maybe some of you haven't done anything illegal at all. However, what James reminds us today is that the standard of God is higher than the standard of this world. You might not have broken many laws in this country. You might have not broken many legal laws. But before God, we would all stand convicted. 
before the one true judge, we haven't got a leg to stand on. And if you hold to the view that I'm fine, I'm going to be okay, I'll be honest, you're in for a rough few minutes because I'm going to challenge your worldview. Because we need to understand that before the perfection of Jesus Christ, we have fallen so short. I find it really interesting that the first thing that James tells us about the law is that we've broken it. The first thing that James says about the law is that if we show favoritism, and that's the sin that James has been working through, and we looked at it last week, and we looked at how we've all shown favoritism. Last week I had many conversations with you, and many people came up to me and said, it's so easy, isn't it? You just instantly, you see somebody, their appearance. Maybe you've heard rumours about them. And you instantly, your mind quickly judges them. And already, you've only seen them for a split second, and you already believe you know everything about them. In our lives, we're, we're so quick to pass judgment on other people. We're very slow to pass judgment on ourselves, but very quick to pass judgment on other people. And so the reality is that we've all sinned. We've all committed sin of various kinds. And verse 9 makes it clear that we are convicted by the law as transgressors. And James mentions, before he explains anything about the law, the first thing he wants you to know is, you're convicted by it. You're guilty. Now this might be because James is speaking to a largely uh, Jewish church, a church of many uh, Jews that have been converted to Christianity, and so they would have known the law. But I, I also think there's a sense here where if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, have you heard that new law? You go, yeah, no, not really, don't really care. But if somebody comes up to you and says, you've broken the law, instantly you're, you're interested by that, aren't you? And so James begins when he's talking about the law by saying, you've broken God's law. James, in the ESV, the word that used is transgressor. The NIV uses the phrase, a lawbreaker. God's commands, God's laws, you've broken. And uh, the reason why I want to specify this is because there's two reasons why I want to mention this today. The first one is because it's true. You might think it's not the most cheery thing. Can't you preach on a nicer passage? The reason why we work through the Bible systematically is because we can't miss out difficult and hard passages. And so the role of John and I is to step into this pulpit and proclaim truth. My role as a preacher is not to make you enjoy. That takes a lot of weight off my shoulders. My job is not to make you feel good as you leave. My job as a preacher is not to entertain you for half an hour because you've got nothing better to do. My job as a minister of Jesus Christ is to preach what is true. And this is what the Bible says. We cannot escape it. We cannot get away from it. The Bible says that we are convicted. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark of perfection. So the first reason I'm telling you about this is because it's true. The second reason I have to tell you about this is because if you did not know that all stand convicted of their sins before a holy God, if you did not know that you were a transgressor and a lawbreaker, then how would you ever understand the glorious, radiant beauty that is found in Jesus Christ? If you do not understand that we are all convicted under the law, if you do not understand that we have broken God's laws, fallen short of him, then you'd be in no need of a saviour. 
The reason why I'm reminding you today that you are sinners in need of saving is because I can in the next breath say, and God has provided that saviour. What we need more than anything else, somebody to rescue, save, redeem, restore, transgressors, Christ has come for that very purpose. We need to know where we stand before God so we realise that we all need Jesus. There is not a single person on this earth who does not need to hear about Jesus. Because there is not a single person on this earth that has not done wrong in the eyes of God. And as we learn and understand we are sinners, the joy and the beauty is that we understand who did Jesus come for? Jesus came for sinners. Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Those who are far away from God, those who have made a mess of their lives, those are the people that Jesus has come to save. And so the law of God convicts us that we have not met the standard of God. But in Jesus, we can be forgiven. In Jesus, we can be restored. Now, my second point doubles down on this. And my second legal term is guilty. If you're still not convinced that you are a transgressor or a lawbreaker, James goes one step further again. Verses 10 and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you don't commit adultery but do murder then you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of people that are guilty, I can think of a few of them, but I seldom think of myself. When we think of those who are guilty, it, it's other people, isn't it? The law of God needs to and should convict us that actually, I'm guilty. In our daily lives, we do not do everything according to the perfect standard of God. I know you well enough. I see you week in, week out. I know you don't. And you know worryingly that I don't either. None of us meet the perfect standard of God. And here we see the great decree is that we are guilty. James says, and it is quite stark language, that if you keep all of God's commandments except one, you've still broken the whole law. And remember, God is the final judge, the eternal judge. In his eyes, if you've done one thing wrong, you've broken his law and you are guilty. I love the analogy of a, of a judge. And that we understand this in, in human terms, and so I want us to understand in human terms and then apply it spiritually. If you were brought before a judge on a murder charge, hopefully that will never happen to you, but if you were brought before a judge on a murder charge for a murder that you committed on the 13th of January, imagine standing up and saying, Your Honour, I did murder him, but there has been plenty of days when I haven't murdered anyone. Surely that's got to count for something. The ridiculousness of that surely is obvious. Imagine saying, well, yeah, I did murder him, but I do a lot of charity work. I go to church. So you have to be lenient on me. The sad reality is, is that would be completely laughed out of court, but many people spiritually take that mindset with God. Yes, I've done things wrong, but God will let me in. I, I've, I've probably done more good than bad. I haven't done as much bad as that person. Friends, I want to remind you that the reality is that a judge judges you on whether you've done something wrong. 
A holy, perfect God will judge us on whether we've done anything wrong. And the truth is, every single one of us in this room, every single one of the people outside of this room, have to admit that when God looks at them, there is one word to describe how we have kept his law. And we will find ourselves guilty. We are all guilty. Sometimes we think about God's law, maybe in, maybe in terms of, of like a football game. And uh, the, the, the football is representative of, uh, of temptation. And we're in goals and we're trying to keep temptation at bay. And sometimes we, we've let three goals in. We, we've sinned three times, but I've saved four. So, so I, I've, say, I've done these sins in there, but actually I, 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 there was a lot of sins I didn't do today. And surely when God looks at my life, it, it's 3-4 to me. It's going to be okay. James says you sin once and you have broken the whole law. James is warning us against this type of legalism. James is letting you know there is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. The best illustration that I could come up with to describe this idea of of if you break one law, you've broken the whole law, is many years ago, my parents bought a a lovely mirror. It was quite an ornate mirror, and it was going to go in our hallway. And it arrived, and it was a beautiful, probably expensive mirror. And when they took it out of the box, it had a lovely crack going through it. And so my parents did what everybody would do. They, they phoned up and said, our mirror's got a crack in it. It's broken. Can we have a new one? And uh, thankfully, the, the people they bought the mirror off were reasonable. So they got a new mirror. Imagine if they phoned up complaining about a crack in the mirror and the person on the other end of the phone said, yes, your mirror has a crack in it, but can't you just look where the crack isn't? There's plenty of places in the mirror that aren't cracked. Just look at those bits. You see, when it comes to the law of God, you might only have one crack. You might only have fallen on one point. I doubt that's true. But even if that were the case, you might only have fallen in one place. One crack. But the whole mirror is cracked, isn't it? You might not have performed every sin imaginable but you've done enough to, in the eyes of God, be guilty. This verse does not mean that all sins are the same. This verse is not saying if you've sinned once, you might as well have a free fall and commit every sin. It's quite the opposite. All sin might not be the same, but all sin will make you a transgressor of the law. Every single thing that we do wrong makes us a lawbreaker. And where do we find ourselves as lawbreakers? We find ourselves guilty before a holy God. My third point comes from verse 12. There is hope. There is hope. You might be guilty before God, but that's not the end of it. That's not the final story. Verse 12 says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. My third point is liberty. Other translations translate liberty as freedom. We are under the law of freedom. I wonder how often you would put law and and liberty together. I wonder how often you'd put law and freedom together. In our world, those are not two words that come side by side. Some people would say they're the complete opposite. If you've got rules to follow, you can't be free. That's what our society says, isn't it? The Bible and and the truth of Scripture makes it clear that this is simply not the case. Too often we think freedom means the ability to break laws. I am free to break law. I am free to live my life. Instead, James declares the opposite. Because of what Jesus Christ 
has done in our lives, we are free for the first time from the bondage of sin. We are free to live for God. The law of Moses was sent to highlight and demonstrate that you need saving. And I'll put it this way as an illustration. Some people have described the law of God as a weighing scale. Now, when you get on a weighing scales, you'll, you stand on the weighing scales, and those scales will tell you that you had a very good Christmas. That's what they tell you. You stand on those scales, and the scales will tell you how far off your objective you are. You're, the scales will not lie to you. The weighing scales will give you an honest reflection of where you are. They will show the reality of your lifestyle. But the weighing scale, when you stand on it, shows you the truth about you. You might not want to hear the truth, but the weighing scales tell you the truth about you. But the weighing scales don't actually help to solve the problem they've identified. Have you ever thought about that? You stand on the scales, they give you bad news, and then you go, well, now I need to do something else. The weighing scales is not going to help me adjust my lifestyle to being something more healthy. In a similar sense, the law of God, the law that God has given, it shows us our sin. It highlights where we have failed. But it doesn't offer a solution. The solution comes in the person of Jesus Christ. There is hope and liberty and freedom in Jesus. James refers to the law of liberty because through Jesus we have a new relationship with the law. Because of what Jesus has done in our lives, because Jesus has regenerated us, he has made us alive. He has set us free from the tyranny of the flesh, the world, and the devil. You, Christian, have a freedom because Jesus has given you life to live for him. And so we as Christians should obey the law or should we live however we like? Our liberty, our freedom, which is only found in Christ Jesus, our freedom is not to ignore the law, but our freedom is who we are in Jesus Christ is, as regenerate people, we so often find ourselves wanting to keep the law. For some people, it is a gradual change that takes their whole lives. For other people in certain areas, it can be quite instant. But have you had that experience where something you used to enjoy as a non-Christian suddenly doesn't feel right? It suddenly grieves you. As a Christian, as we're on this gradual walk of sanctification, what we see and what we notice is we're changing. We're being conformed to our Lord. We have freedom now to live for Jesus Christ, to make choices to live for him. When we were in the, the darkness of our sin, we were captivated by sin. The Bible says we were slaves to sin. And our freedom now enables us for the first time to choose Jesus. Because God has regenerated us, because God has made us alive, we have liberty to follow God's law. And I'm sure you've experienced that. The way that we live now if you've been a Christian for any, any length of time, is not the way you used to live. By God's grace and by God's mercy, he has given you liberty to live for him. We have are, we are freedom to resist sin, which has held us back for so long. I love the old chorus, and we'll, uh, we'll sing the chorus afterwards. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim 
in the light of his glory and grace. As we live the Christian life, we should be becoming more like him. And the flesh and the sins, the more we look at them, the more they should be less appealing to us. Because our Jesus is greater. Greater than anything in this world. Because God has regenerated us, we are free to live for him. Now I have not got the time to elaborate on this point as much as I'd like. But I would recommend you read, in my view, the best one, one or two page, depending on the font size, one, the best one or two page summary that I've ever read on this topic of freedom and the law. It's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called Romans 6. Read Romans 6 if you want to know the relationship that we were once slaves to sin, but now we live righteous lives to God because he has made us alive in Christ. Read Romans 6, I urge you, but listen to verse 10 and 11 of the great chapter. Speaking of Jesus, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Friends, that is the freedom that you have. As uh, one of my favourite hymns says, Long my imprisoned soul. As we talk about our sin was captured, it was imprisoned, it was stuck, and then meeting Jesus... The great chorus says, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed me. We have been set free from the claims and clutches of sin for us to walk to Jesus Christ. This is the true liberty of the law. And with the three minutes I've got left, I've got a final point. My final legal statement is, if you are found to be guilty, then the judge has the ability to pass judgment on you. My final point is judgment, and this is taken from verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I don't think this is... I, James is not talking about things of eternal salvation. I think what James is doing, once again, is paraphrasing what, was, uh, what Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount. This verse in verse 13 is very similar to, to Matthew 7 and verse 2, where Jesus says, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. What Jesus is saying here is, and this section has been talking in chapter 2 about favoritism and partiality, about us, how we instantly pass judgments. And the reminder here is, who are you to judge? Jesus warns us that if you're somebody who is judging others, do you yourself expect to escape judgment yourself? We as Christians are called to not be a judgmental people, but a people of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And it's a reminder in our Christian lives how we are not to be judging everyone who walks into the church or judging people who don't walk into the church. But we are to be a people distinguished by mercy. Our lives are to overflow Mercy. We need to show mercy to those who do not deserve it. And you might be saying, Sam, how can I show mercy to someone who does not deserve it? How can God expect me to show mercy to someone as horrible as this person in work? How can God expect me to show mercy to somebody who laughs at me every time I go to church? 
How can God expect me to show mercy to someone who is undeserving as, insert the name of the person you're thinking about now, how can God expect that of me? Friend, have you not been listening to a word I've said today? You deserve nothing from God but judgment. You deserve nothing from God but a guilty conviction. You deserve nothing from God than to be identified as what you are, a transgressor and a lawbreaker. But all who have accepted Jesus have found mercy they do not deserve. Mercy that they cannot fathom. Mercy from God that our tiny little minds cannot comprehend or understand. What we have received from Jesus Christ is so deep, so vast, so great. How can we not show it to other people? How can we not see and understand what God has done for me is so great? Because we so should show mercy to other people. We as Christians should be glimmers of what God has done in us through salvation. I do not fear death. I do not fear the the judgment of God in the same way. What will be my cry today? What will be my cry tomorrow? What will be my cry when I die and come face to face with a holy God for whom I have broken the whole of his law? What will my cry be? What can I say to the living God I will say the great promise that for everyone who knows Jesus, we can say God's mercy triumphs over judgment. That though I deserve his judgment, in Jesus Christ I have found freedom and liberty from the judgment of God. Friends, do you know what it is to come to Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is for mercy to triumph? over judgment. Amen.